the crypt. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. We're here on another Friday afternoon happy hour, sitting in Barstool Sports Studios in Flatiron, part of New York City. Sitting down with another very special guest, as always, uh, another member of the Chain Code Labs team, Bitcoin Core contributor, um, and somebody who's been with Core for for uh, years now, and somebody I respect. His Twitter game's great. That's how I found him, um, and was fortunate enough to meet him at a BitDevs meetup here in New York as well. So I'd like to introduce you all to Matt Corallo. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. I know... Um, I know Friday afternoons are tough to get in the studio, but uh, I think I think these pilsners will help will help ease the situation. I had to bribe you to get here. I'm, I'm easily lured by free beer. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wanted to let's just jump right into it. Uh, you've been a core dev for how many years now? Um, let's see. I got into Bitcoin kind of early 2011 in February 2011, I think. And I think my first contribution was late summer 2011. Mm-hmm. So a number of years now. How'd you find it? What's your Bitcoin story? Uh, a podcast, ironically. Um, a, a podcast that I listened to regularly did a whole like hour long introduction of Bitcoin, which really exposed me to a lot of the technical details and a lot of stuff that maybe I otherwise wouldn't have wouldn't have come across. It was around the time of, I think, maybe the second or third slash dotting. So. Mm-hmm. And what were you doing before Bitcoin? Uh, I was in high school, actually. In Holy fact, I was shit. still in high school for the first year and change that I contributed to Bitcoin. Um, All right, so you're younger than me. I always thought we were like the same age. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I was gonna... the youngest by, I think, 11 at Blockstream of the co-founding team. That's... So I'm... Yeah, that's incredible. That's incredible. Feat. I never <laughs> knew that. Um, so one thing that that you've worked on, that you are working on, uh, and sort of built in the past is the fiber network. Uh, for you freaks out there that don't know, the fiber network stands for Fast Internet Bitcoin Relay Engine, um, and this is uh, this is something that allows uh, people to relay blocks with a network of nodes uh, with almost no delay. And why why is this important, or why was this important when you were building it? Yeah, so so Fiber is kind of a maybe the third generation of kind of fast block relay stuff that I've worked on. Um, so maybe a year or two after the Selfish Mining paper. So for those of you who remember, oh gosh, I don't I don't remember what year it is anymore. But Selfish Mining is is an attack on Bitcoin um, that was known on some various parts of the Bitcoin community, and then the Selfish Mining paper uh, by Emin Gunsir and a few others. Um, formalized it, and so it, it's this attack where if you have kind of better network connectivity than all of the other miners, you can get more blocks than you necessarily should with a given hash rate. So let's say you have 10% of the network hash rate. If you are successful at a selfish mining attack, you might get, for example, 12% of blocks. Um, if As your hash rate goes up, your potential for gains increases. So if you have 40% of hash rate, you might get 60% of blocks. So you can get a pretty big advantage. And do these problems have to deal with like local internet latency or? Yeah. So, I mean, any internet latency, if you, if you can have, I'm going to butcher exactly the, the, the network setup, but effectively, if you can have a uh, better visibility into when other miners find blocks and you can race their blocks and when they find a block they have to tell everyone else about it if you can hear that they found a block and then tell everyone else faster about your block then they can tell people about their block then you could potentially significantly increase your gains yeah this is very reminiscent of the high frequency trading problem you have in traditional financial markets sort of Mm -hmm. the high freaks what flash boys was written about these algorithms were sort of cutting the line and and siphoning off fractions of a penny, but yeah, I mean the 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 kind of original high frequency trading stuff was all about uh, having information asymmetry, hearing about some trade in New York, and, and acting based on it in London faster than anyone else can. It, it's very very similar attack. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so to answer your question, I guess the um, so I. One kind of obvious solution to this is to try to put everyone on equal footing, right? If you can only pull this attack, if you have better network visibility than everyone else, then providing a free and open and anyone can use it network that has hopefully really good network properties and really fast relay, 
will make it so that no one can get this kind of really easy advantage, or at least we'll have to put in orders of magnitude more effort to do it. Um, and so I've built and maintained various networks over the years. Fiber is kind of the latest generation and is based on all kinds of interesting other kind of low-level technology to make it just super, super fast, to make it very reliably, I don't know, 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, more than the speed of light between servers. So oh, wow. it's uh, speed of light between servers, you know, if you're crossing an ocean, can be 80, 100 milliseconds round trip. Mm-hmm. So, Damn. And one important thing, one important tidbit you said in that rant there is that you are maintaining this. So you personally, <laughs> right? So I, what I understand, a couple of bit devs meetups ago, you're saying, that, so you're paying for like the, ho- or the, the... Yeah, I, I pay for some servers now yeah. uh, to do it. I, I originally ran some of these networks, paid for some really cheap VMs, um, and then I figured, you know, there's even better advantages to be had if I get really nice dedicated servers and I tried to get some folks to... Um, to, to fund me to do it and got some folks to pay for the servers, but it's a real pain in the ass to harass people to give you money on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. So I, I eventually gave that up, moved back to some some uh, VMs, and I'm now paying a few hundred bucks a month to run this thing. Are there any efforts to to sort of make this more aware to the community that this is something that, that maybe we should crowdfund? Yeah, I mean, I think it's not, not a huge deal in mm-hmm. terms of money, um, but it's also something that you know if you are a regular user you don't really care you don't have any reason to use this network right what do you care if you get a block in one second versus 10 seconds after a miner found it it doesn't really matter to you whereas of course if you're a miner one second or 10 second can make the difference between going out of business and being in business yeah yeah. um so you know it's something i i work with a lot of pools and some miners on it but I, i mean i think it's a great example of something in the space or someone in the space is selfless and sort of, I don't want to make it blush or anything here, but like this sort of, this is a peer to peer network and individuals, if they want, can contribute and make it better. And what you're doing with fiber, I would put forward is something very selfless to a certain extent and um, is people need to follow your example. Yeah, um, I, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I mean, the technology itself is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the stuff that went into it is really just really interesting technology to me. I mean, building kind of ver- really low latency um, networking and very low latency um, processing for, you know, there's not many other excuses to do that in Bitcoin at kind of that level, um, but, but just really fun to build, <laughs> Yeah, if I'm honest. Um, so another part of the Bitcoin tech that you're interested in, from what I can tell, is fungibility. Um, I was watching your talk uh, with Adam back last year in Milan um, about fungibility and sort of the the uh, the tools that are out there in the in the crypto world that uh, yeah. that help fungibility um, for their uh, for the freaks out there. I guess we should start uh, defining fungibility. What is fungibility for somebody who's new to Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, so <laughs> it goes back to I don't know a 13th century Scottish court case or something absurd, but. All of that aside, all it means is that one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. That if you receive a Bitcoin from someone who just received it from Silk Road, that should be no different to you from someone who paid you Bitcoin directly from Coinbase or some other reputable company. Um, because ultimately, you know, just like cash, right? If you had, if you had some responsibility for every time you received a twenty dollar bill to make sure that there's no cocaine on the twenty dollar bill. <laughs> then all of a sudden every corner store has to hire some drug-sniffing dog and it just becomes ridiculous and no one could do business. Completely inefficient. Right, so so this is, ends up being a really critical property for Bitcoin to function because if everyone has to pay chain analysis or coin validation or whatever, some third-party company for every Bitcoin they receive and make sure it's not on some blacklist, then Bitcoin is useless and like, mm-hmm. why the hell did we build this distributed system, this peer-to-peer thing if... You just have to ask Bob whether or not this coin is okay. Yeah. And that's one thing. The CEO of Chain Analysis was on CNBC earlier today <laughs> saying that uh, he thinks this Bitcoin rally, rally is ephemeral. It might be. But, um, yeah, that's something that skews me out in the space is companies like Chain Analysis that are really trying to track people down and not track people down, but follow people on the Bitcoin network, which 
again, like you touched on, is sort of against the whole ethos of why this technology was invented or discovered. Whatever. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not something we're going to be able to stop right now in the current technology landscape that is Bitcoin. Um, it has become a part of the pitch to regulators that Bitcoin is okay. Uh, so there's a lot of po folks who have, over the years, spoken to regulators. And when regulators ask about Silk Road or regulators ask about whatever kind of money laundering issues, they point to coin analysis, chain analysis, coin validation, whatever. And, and they point to these guys and they say, like, no, actually, we we do monitoring of where transactions are flowing and try to identify cases that are um, potentially illegal or potentially, you know, against some jurisdiction's wishes. Um, and, and it has been a very successful argument to, regulator, to regulators. Um, it's, so, I, you know, it's something that's not all bad, and you can't just kind of write it off and say, like, this is terrible. It has helped Bitcoin in some ways, but at the same time, it's something that at a technology layer, I think we need to work our best to get rid of. I think this is a... Yeah. <laughs> it's funny to compare this to kind of early days internet. Uh, if you talk to a lot of the folks, or at least some of the folks who kind of were in building kind of the internet and getting excited about the internet in on day one, like building the web, right? You compare what their vision was to the internet today and how people actually interact with the internet today, and for all intents and purposes, the internet has failed to live up to its vision. Really? Right, because today there's a lot of places, and to some extent also in the West, where the internet is Facebook, mm -hmm. and like yeah. that. I mean, that, that's not the internet that was people wanted to build, right? They wanted to build this great decentralizing force that would open up markets and open up media and information and information sharing, and it wouldn't be controlled in walled gardens. That's Facebook's trying to become like the one-stop shop for the internet that's yeah that's zuck's goal um, yeah and and it has succeeded in some countries in some parts of the world so you know i mean to some extent the internet failed in that regard in some areas and bitcoin has a lot of potential to go down the same route it has a lot of potential to fall into similar traps where it is going to be uh, you know you can build a centralized system on top of bitcoin that's going to be better than just using Bitcoin directly. You always will be able to, just like Facebook can build on top of the internet and give you a better product than like going on Craigslist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's always about how do we make sure Bitcoin... Still a big fan of Craigslist, by the way. I like Craigslist. Yeah, I mean, it's helped me find many apartments. That's a perfect example of, uh, of, a, of a website with utility that doesn't need great design. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of impressed that Craigslist is still around with, with such yeah. interesting design. But anyway, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> no, good. Um, no, I, I think we have a lot of risk of Bitcoin going down the same route, so we have to make sure that the kind of easy route and the most, you know, the, the technology forces you down a route or at least strongly incentivizes you down a route, or if nothing else, doesn't... You know, that, that Bitcoin used in a decentralized and open way is as close in terms of user experience and in terms of quality of service and whatever that we can get compared to, you know, using Coinbase and only paying people within Coinbase or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. And it looks like, I mean, that's one thing John and I talked about was people need to exert some, some sense of patience because it's going to take time to build these oh, yeah. these. Uh, apps with good UX. Yeah, um, it looks like we Never. might have one on the horizon in Lightning. Um, yeah, some of the Lightning apps look really slick. I mean, I was, I, I'm sure uh, a few of you Bitcoiners that are listening um, have seen Jack Mahler's Zap app. That mm -hmm. looks really cool. Yeah, uh, that's one. <laughs> and they're testing that on y'all's network, <laughs> y'all's dot org. <laughs> low key, the great. low key, the best troll troll in Bitcoin to oh, date. Yeah. Oh yeah, I think uh, it's gonna be a billion dollar company by the end of the year. Uh, I thought that was yours. Yeah, whatever. Both no, of yours them, right? or not? Yeah, eh. <laughs> same thing, right? Um, yeah, basically. Um, actually, not basically. <laughs> uh, I mean, one is testnet coin, one's other coins. One I don't know. Other, yeah, B cash. 
or Bitcoin Cash. Don't don't say Bcash in front of Jihan or Roger. Um, yeah, not in front of Roger. But let's go back. Let's go back to fungibility for a second here. <laughs> like, are what? How are we getting? Are we getting better? Do you think, or are we getting worse? Are we getting less fungible or more fungible as we move forward? And what projects are helping or hurting? I think we are. I think this is maybe a controversial opinion uh, within the development community. We but love I think, controversy here. <laughs> but I think we've we've lost the fungibility battle at the blockchain layer. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's still a lot of desire to add better fungibility at the blockchain layer, whether that's through confidential transactions, which is a, a blockstream design that has been worked on by numerous people and kind of spawned Mimblewimble. Um or some various other proposals. Um, but but I don't think those are kind of likely to happen anytime soon because, I mean, one, the, the kind of design, the technology isn't there yet. The crypto isn't quite there to be scalable in the way people would like. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and But more importantly, I think some of these folks who... Excuse me. Uh, some of these folks who... Sorry. Some Probably of these folks who... Um, so some of these folks who have um, built a relationship with regulators on the basis of coin validation and chain analysis and some of these products are going to be very vocal about objecting to changes to add more fungibility to the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain layer. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still, I am, I, I would hope that we succeed in adding more fungibility properties of the Bitcoin blockchain layer. And there's certainly things people can do on an individual level and wallet management and stuff like that and, and mm-hmm. coin selection that would improve significantly. But I'm not, I don't know that things are going to happen directly at the consensus layer. I think everything yeah. in fungibility is going to happen at the next layers up. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think there's a lot we can do there. So I mentioned coin selection just the way your wallet works so having your wallet you know use more addresses and having your wallet be smarter about uh making it obvious which coins all go together in one wallet Mm -hmm. that's something that could use a lot of work right now yeah but also i mean when you think about things like lightning and tumblebit and some of these sidechain stuff a lot of the second layer scalability solutions that people are talking about right now have really good fungibility properties, or at least potentially. And I think that was kind of the thrust of the Scaling Bitcoin talk uh, that you mentioned that I gave with Adam, where it's really about talking about fungibility really matters, but also we don't have to get it at the Bitcoin consensus mm-hmm. layer. We can get it at the next layers up and the ways people interact with Bitcoin or are going to interact with Bitcoin in the future. Potentially, we can start setting the stage now to win the fungibility battle there even mm-hmm. if we don't win it at the consensus layer yeah and then you have like really creative um <coughs> sort of uh workarounds to this like uh, projects like open dime with uh rodolfo mm-hmm. like that's one very interesting project that that fascinates me because uh for you freaks out there they don't know what open dime is it's basically a usb stick that you would transact as you would dollars your ba- your you would put a certain amount of Bitcoin on that open dime and you'd hand it off physically to somebody without ever making a, a transaction on the blockchain. Um, what are your thoughts on open dime? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's a different trust model, right? Yeah. There's, uh, it's not quite like dollar in the sense that like, if someone hands you a dollar and it's fake, you probably are still going to be able to spend it, Like, let's be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas open dime, if someone hands you an open dime where the, the underlying Bitcoin in it doesn't actually exist or it's a fake or something, that you're probably screwed um but but that's not to say it's not really cool i mean i think it's important to explore a lot of different trust models in how people use bitcoin because that's what's going to lead to really interesting fungibility properties and really interesting scalability properties and all these things that you're not going to get if we all stick with the same trust model of well i need six confirmations on the blockchain (laughs) um but but for for exploring new trust models, open time is really awesome, and certainly for small value, like I take open time. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely look up open time if you haven't already. It's a very um, very interesting uh, hardware tech, in my opinion. Uh, and Rodolf- Rodolfo, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, uh, is one of my favorites on on crypto Twitter. <laughs> um, 
But let's uh, let's take this down to lightning because lightning. There's a lot of talk about lightning. Um, yeah. Recently, they just launched on the main main net. They're doing some transactions on the main net, correct? Yeah, my understanding is they um they don't they haven't released the software yet for it. Uh, it should mm-hmm. be soon, TM. Um, but they but they have been testing on mainnet and they've been they've been kind of prepping all of their the various teams prepping all the implementations to make them make sure they're compatible on mainnet and if we were to uh break this down for the listeners how would you describe <laughs> lightning network um Oof. um lightning network is the ultimate implementation of something which was designed and explicitly uh provided for in the bitcoin protocol by satoshi really yeah payment channel payment, channel. payment channels for satoshi's idea building payment channel networks an obvious extension of that lightning is a really clever trick to making those uh more scalable on a broad network instead of kind of the centralized uh, payment channel networks that people were expecting previously um but I mean, the amount of work that's gone into Lightning shouldn't be discarded, but these guys have built this kind of super scalable way to move Bitcoins between people in this network where you're really moving Bitcoin. You're not moving some, like, Bitcoin that will be settled later or whatever. You're, you're moving Bitcoin between people in this network in a way that scales uh, very, very well. I mean, like, almost as well it. as you can do in terms of, like, just being able to send money instantly. And touched on this last week with John a little bit, but let's let's talk about first layer scaling versus, <laughs> versus second layer. Like, so there's, this, again, freaks, there's a huge debate about whether every transaction should be at the protocol level on-chain or we should build... Yeah. Uh, second layers that handle a lot of the traffic and this is my opinion and john and i actually didn't get to talk about this on air we had a conversation after that i wish we were recording but in my opinion the way i visualize bitcoin and see it growing is that we should have a slow dumb protocol at the protocol level that is a little cumbersome to some extent it's 10 minute confirmation times um it's going to be more expensive if everybody's trying to do things on chain i think we should have a keep it simple stupid mindset with the protocol level just keep it slow and lumbersome and then build apps on top of that um yeah what what is your view <laughs> what what is the argument for <laughs> yeah how would you argue for this if you if you do agree with uh, yeah i mean I, I i mean i think obviously that's kind of my impression i think it's i, I think there are if you want something other than that there are how many altcoins that will provide you that? I mean, and to p- take your pick about how you think Bitcoin should be changed, there's an altcoin that does it in that way, right? So, I mean, if there's if there's something that differentiates Bitcoin still, it's the amount of, you know, kind of the conservatism towards changes and kind of that viewpoint that it is a system that should be as robust as possible. And then you can build things on top of it and making sure that it is easy to build things on top that are as good as you can do. I mean, it, as for your kind of earlier question about just how, you know, how should we be thinking about scaling Bitcoin? I mean, this gets back to the comments on Open Dime, right? Bitcoin should be, we should be exploring what trust models make sense in what contexts, right? So you don't always have to take a transaction on the chain, wait a week of confirmations, and then be really confident in it. In fact, no one even does that yet. I mean, that's kind of the ultimate Bitcoin trust model is a week or a month of confirmations. Really? Yeah, I mean, if you were to compromise Alien, which is a Chinese Chinese Amazon Web Services, effectively, um, plus maybe a few other servers, you'd probably get well over 50% of hash rate for a brief period of time. You could steal, you know, whatever, four or five pool servers, and you would own all of the hash rate for a while of course they'd fix it pretty quick but Mm -hmm. you'd own it for an hour right so when you're talking about just an hour of confirmations you know maybe that there are some attacks you can do against that that wouldn't necessarily quote break bitcoin but they would kind of make your six confirmations bogus who knows right so you get a reorg yeah i mean like if they 
if you're an SPV client or something, they could mine invalid blocks. Maybe they could do a big reorg. Who knows, right? Yeah. So, you know, there are there are various shades of gray here. There's like wait a month of confirmations. There's wait six confirmations. There's wait one confirmation. There's wait no confirmations. You know, all of these make sense in different contexts. Similarly, there's Lightning. There's Tumblebit. There's uh, federated sidechains, there's merged mind sidechains, all of these things make sense in different contexts and all fit on this kind of shades of gray of what kind of trust model you need and who are you willing to trust, right? If you're willing to trust Coinbase and you think Coinbase is a great company, but you want Bitcoin for the 21 million coins property, you want it for the stable value because you're in Venezuela and the boulevard is completely screwing you right now, Maybe Coinbase is fine. What's wrong with that, right? It's not... I mean, I think that's controversial in the cryptocurrency community sometimes, yeah. but if that is what you want, great. Coinbase is going to provide you a better user experience than, like, Bitcoin on the chain ever will. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a lot of room right now to be exploring different trust models and utilizing all these different trust models as best as we can. And I think Lightning and all these other things fit into that. And building things on top of Bitcoin really gives us a lot of room to explore, a lot of rooms to scale, and a lot of room to kind of make sure that that ultimate Bitcoin trust model of looking for transactions on the blockchain really is ultimate in terms of not having to trust anyone. While you can still interact with Bitcoin in more friendly ways if you're willing to relax that core. Yeah, no, and it's... I think this is the most exciting time in Bitcoin. I mean, that could be said at any point in time. But um, no, the the emergence of Lightning, like we're we're finally we're finally going to be experimenting on the second layer, which I'm um, I'm pumped for. Yeah, and I think everybody else should be, even if even if Lightning fails. It, I mean, it, it at least we're experimenting. I don't think. Yeah. It, I mean, I can't speak with authority on this. I don't know if it will or won't, but. Um, yeah, I mean, even if it's only adopted in very small niches, mm -hmm. so what? I mean, that's still certain niches that were happy to use this trust model and are no longer competing with you for blockchain space. Great. Yeah, and um, so that's let's segue that into sort of you touched on the conservative nature of the course process right now, uh, the way they approach Bitcoin, making changes to the protocol and changes to Bitcoin. Um so there's there's a lot of blockchains out there that I think we should move fast and break things to a certain mm -hmm. extent and have have more uh, urgency in scaling. Um, what do you think about the different approaches right now? So obviously yeah. you, you're core, you're conservative. Um, Ethereum's move fast and break things. Bcash maybe move fast and break things. They've hard forked and then they've, have they done two hard forks since? I think they have done or just one, one just one and they've got two more planned or yeah two like more that. planned and then you have coins like monero that have planned hard forks and stuff like that so mm -hmm. sort of the, the landscape of um blockchain uh development uh processes is yeah. is is varying right now and if you i don't want to put you on the spot make you like <laughs> make you i don't want to say shit on anybody but like um what I think, what, like, what is what are the advantages and disadvantages to each approach? Yeah, I, I think maybe uh, at, at this rate, trust is going to be the the most used word in this mm -hmm. uh, whole <laughs> podcast. But I, I think trust is is maybe a better way to look at these things in context than um than kind of move fast and break things versus conservatism. I think the lens through which I look at changes to Bitcoin at the consensus layer um, and how I compare Bitcoin to most other coins in the space uh, has to do with who am I trusting to use it. And I think that at this kind of I mean, th viewed through this lens, Bitcoin is the only system where you don't trust someone else, right? Ethereum whether it's move fast and break things or not, it is clearly, you know, there's a few developers, a few different teams, whatever, but when they say this is the new Ethereum hard fork, this is the way it's going, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> maybe with some offshoots here and there. 
Uh, but same thing with Bitcoin Cash, right? Bitcoin Cash, these folks have two planned hard forks and they announced it and they rolled it out and they're like, these are the hard forks. This is what's going to happen with Bitcoin Cash. Great. That's fine. That's a great way to run a system in, in depending on your trust model. But if my goal is to not trust anyone and use Bitcoin or not trust anyone to use Bcash, I can't, mm-hmm. right? I'm trusting these developers to make decisions for the network that will ultimately impact the long-term properties of how this network operates. And, uh, you know, and, and you can argue all day long about whether those properties are good or bad or, or what the, the goals are and what properties Bitcoin or other systems should have. But ultimately, if your goal is to not trust the developers, to not trust the community even, to change the system out from under you, you have to have a process of letting objections take hold, of letting... If there's some group of stakeholders in the system, there's some group of Bitcoin users, whatever their view is, and they say, screw you, this change makes it so that I can't use Bitcoin in the way that I was hoping to, in the way that I had planned to, kind of have to be willing to say, okay, so that change doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the lens through which I view consensus changes in Bitcoin, because I think Looking at it through the lens of like, well, Core is conservative. Well, I think Core is conservative in the sense that Core doesn't want to quote Core. You know, the, the group of people that it contribute to Core, the the kind of Core process is that consensus changes don't happen unless there is pretty clear consensus in the community, mm-hmm. and it's less about kind of technical details and whatever. And and we do consensus, uh, we do contentious changes to the non-consensus part of Bitcoin Core occasionally. I mean, it's pretty rare that people complain about details of wallet performance improvements, but mm-hmm. whatever, you know, we, we're like a software project when it comes to the wallet, when it comes to interfaces and APIs and whatever, that's, you know, we're a software project. Yeah. But when it comes to the consensus rules part of Bitcoin Core, that is a whole different ballgame. And then we start talking about what is the community view and, and is there a strong objection in the community and then what does that mean for... And how do you even measure what the community is? And Yeah, I mean, these are these are difficult questions. Yeah, but. very difficult questions. And that's one thing John and I touched on last week where I think a lot of these move fast and break thing mentality chains uh, are a little misguided is that we're going to find that, that Bitcoin and other blockchains are going to change us more than we change them um, to a certain extent. We're going to... we're gonna. Oh, that's deep. It is. We got cos- We get cosmic here. Whoa. This is something that surprised John. He was not ready to get cosmic. I, I hope feel you're... like I need another beer for that. <laughs> I got you. Um, no, but that's like one thing. Again, like I said, John and I touched on the, long, the long-term view of all this stuff and um, basically touching on we're the first guardians of these technologies and we, we envision them to be around for decades possibly centuries potentially millennia who knows um and to think that we're going to be able to figure out exactly how these things work in the first decade as the first arbiters of the network while we're still trying to figure out exactly what these technologies are yeah um, totally uh, i think it's a little hubristic and uh, like i was telling definitely like I was telling John last week, I think we're gonna find going forward, as we as we live with these blockchains for decades, that they change us more than than we're gonna be able to change them because it is hard to reach that consensus. Like how how do you get to consensus and um, does a certain governance model? favored over another sort of defeat the purpose of, of a peer-to-peer network where you can define what your money is and, and the fact that a small, somewhat centralized group of people can change it sort of defeats the purpose in my mind. Yeah, I, I mean, I I tend to wholesale agree there. I mean, I think the anyone who tells you they, they understand Bitcoin, anyone who tells you they're a Bitcoin expert is a fucking moron. <laughs> Uh, let's be honest. That's what we have no idea. For all you freaks that watch Barstool, and so this week I got on one of their shows called The Rundown, and they referred to me as a Bitcoin expert <laughs> while I wasn't on camera. I didn't know. I'm not a Bitcoin expert. I've just I've just been fascinated by this for years. Fair and, enough. And know and know a little bit about the space. 
but but yeah, I think I think we're all still discovering what in the hell this thing is and and what properties, you know, what properties should it have and and what practical details of process of consensus changes and process of whatever and and technical details is required for the properties that people want, right? What 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 are all the properties that are important and how do we weigh those properties? I think is something we're all still figuring out. Um, someone put it to me. Uh, likes to call it a culture war, right? Mm-hmm. Bitcoin right now, we're in a culture war. We're mm-hmm. we're trying to, you know, figure out what culture across the Bitcoin community is required for the properties that we want with respect to how consensus changes are made. Um, and and trying to kind of get to the point where your culture wins. Well, I mean, ultimately, that's going to define what these systems are mm-hmm. over the next ten, twenty years. And so, you know, people need to be thinking in that context and unless how do I make my business run next year? Exactly. And that's my point is that maybe none of the cultures win and they're just forced to to mm. evolve uh, to to what Bitcoin does. And yeah, that's some, I mean, personally, I mean, you meet a lot of Bitcoiners and they'll openly admit Bitcoin has changed my tendencies, my saving tendencies, the way <laughs> I view money, the way I view going out and spending money. It has changed me. I can. I know that I'll speak for myself. It has changed my view of money and how I, I, I definitely have view. I definitely weigh the opportunity cost of spending money versus saving it now. I, and I was yeah. a frivolous, frivolous spender for much of my life. Yeah, I mean, the, the number of Bitcoiners who got into Bitcoin and then realized that they need to research monetary policy and have an opinion on monetary policy <laughs> so that they can have conversations with other Bitcoiners seems very high. <laughs> and I'm still not convinced that everyone in Bitcoin having an opinion on monetary policy is a good thing, but it's a good somehow we all we all do. It's we now all have a have a view on it. Especially this day and age, it's commerce. I mean, I'm in economics. I was an economics major in college. That's where I studied, and that's how I came to Bitcoin was from a monetary perspective. But I think it is. I, I don't think anybody. Need, I don't think everybody needs to be an expert on monetary policy. But I think. Uh, it is a conversation that needs to be had that people should understand what money is because we yeah. were sort of born into a situation where it's just like, hey, this is money. This is how it works. I go to the grocery store, I use these dollars, but nobody truly understands what they represent and yeah. how that system can become bastardized and is becoming bastardized to a certain extent. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't claim to be an expert in economics. It's one of those things that I'm, always fascinated by and have never taken enough uh formal courses or formal formal knowledge on it um but it's always something that i look at and i you know any conversation that people talk about especially when you start talking about politics you start talking about you know what people's views are for the future of the country and the future of the world i'm always constantly disappointed by the lack of economics knowledge in that conversation because it's so important it's so i mean everyone saying talks oh, about money it. money is the root of everything it's the root of yeah. all evil everything starts with money and especially politics and every mon- politician is sitting there like okay first priority is jobs second priority is, is jobs and third priority is jobs well like okay well all of a sudden you need to be having a pretty detailed conversation about economic macroeconomic structure before you can really you know yeah, evaluate and, that kind of thing. And uh, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of QE, but like <laughs> you Oof, can't, you yeah. can't. I mean, am I, this is so the U.S. the Federal Reserve was created in 1913. From 1913 to 2008, their balance sheet expanded from zero dollars to 800 billion, almost 100 years, 95 years. It goes from zero to 800 billion. From 2008 till 2014, I think six years, it went from 800 billion to 4.3 trillion. So you have, <laughs> it's, you have it's slightly absurd. You have an overt quadrupling of the monetary base that took 100 years to get to that point in yeah. six years. Like, just if just looking at nature, that that is unnatural, and I don't think it's it's uh, sustainable in the long run. Yeah, I mean that's it. I, I mean, again, I'm I'm no economics expert. I don't know shit about, shit about economics. I shouldn't be uh, proclaiming to know anything about it. But it, it seems to me like, you know, you, you talk to folks who, who are watching these things, talk to folks who are watching economic theory and trying to apply it to reality. And they're looking at this and they're like, oh, shit. I mean, yeah, there's nowhere else for people to put their money. So they keep putting it in the stock market and they keep putting it 
in bonds and there's nowhere else in the world you want to put your money so you end up putting it in u.s bonds and bond rates are low and the fed keeps buying these things so they're low the interest rates are low but the economic theory just doesn't explain it anything doesn't. anymore because everything is so absurd it doesn't make s- mathematically like it might crazy. not make sense <laughs> the amount of interest that we have to pay back going forward it's insane people don't like to have these conversations a lot of people keep their heads in the sand say oh we're good we're good we're the u.s we're the u.s government the dollars backed by the u.s army <laughs> we're gonna be good <laughs> well i mean we- the reality is it's backed by people's faith in the u.s over other places in the world and yes. right now there's not many places in the world you'd really want to put your money no uh, europe's had been a consistent shit show since 2008 the u.s is a shit show but it's not that much of a shit show uh, donald trump is our president uh, okay <laughs> if you ignore that it's you know no, whatever sure. uh like still- china is still going through all kinds of issues australia is actually not terrible although they've been doing too well recently that's not sustainable yeah, russia's a shit show i mean well like, everything's a shit show everything there's shit nowhere show. to put fucking money anymore no, and the biggest example of this shit show is actually japan oh god oh dear god so ah, abe was re-elected though abe was re-elected um but they are the prime example they've been doing qe for 30 years and they the <laughs> J- japan the bank of japan owns i think 80 percent of the japanese government bond market and then 50 percent of the japanese etf market so it's funny what's the old saying there's three types of economies in the world developed developing and japan (laughs) it seems like we're now at developing and japan yeah because like everything else is the same thing now it's just like crazy it doesn't make sense mathematically anymore kind no. of economy is it's where japan's always been and that's where most of the west is going now so when i was in college i started working for a managed futures fund and so and part of my job there was an analyst what my job part of my job was was to follow central banks around the world and sort of comment on their monetary policy and <laughs> while i was doing this you had 22 central banks around the world coordinating dovish monetary policy so printing money and and trying to inflate stock markets and asset prices yeah it's not sustainable you can't have like that is in my opinion like that's why i left it was was like a death row of all right we give up we're just gonna pump pump the economies full of assets that we just printed uh and it got to a certain point where all these central banks were setting targets. They were setting projections. They were never getting close to them. And I was like, this is all fucking bullshit. Like, I'm not yeah. going to waste my time. It, no, it is It is crazy. It, it's funny because, you know, historically the response to that is like, well, the central banks lost it. They're crazy. Everyone takes their money out, puts it somewhere else. And then that's kind of what makes the math work. Economics largely is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Everyone expects it to behave this way. And so the market predicts that, prices it in. And so that's how things work. But when there's nowhere else to take your money, like if some central bank, some country is doing something completely crazy, and normally you would take your money out of that and put it somewhere else because that's crazy, but everyone's doing that, all of a sudden it's like, well, well, wait a second. Normally the way that people get punished by having crazy monetary policy and printing money and whatever else, it doesn't work anymore because no one's going to take their money out and, and what put it under the mattress i mean that's shit too like yeah. go buy gold well you know everyone kind of gave up on that one and that's also not useful like yeah. at a certain point enter bitcoin <laughs> enter bitcoin <laughs> and that's one thing um where are we at 15k yeah, we're at like 15.5 i think absolutely absurd uh 15.8 uh, very absurd. So yeah, let's talk about that this week. So we started the week with crypto kitties. We ended the week at fifteen fifteen thousand eight hundred dollar Bitcoin. Um, God, it's been a it's been a chaotic week. It's it, been insane. It's been insane. And I wrote about today in my newsletter, like all the financial analysts out there, CNBC, Bloomberg, all the hedge fund managers who are sixty years old and know what the future holds for us, uh, saying this is unsustainable. I would agree to a certain extent. It's not going to go up forever. Physics has to come into play at some point. But I would put forth that we have to start looking at these price charts maybe more as adoption charts. And the price is just an indicator of of the adoption level of Bitcoin. Because you have a truly scarce new asset class um, 
that people are pouring money into and then you ha- and you you have a legit liquidity crunch right now because of the hodl mon- mindset that a lot yeah. of people in bitcoin have and, and people are are hearing about bitcoin and the news cycles bitcoin buy bitcoin google searches are at all-time highs stuff like million that. dollars are bust yeah million dollars are bust is i mean it's the uh the morpheus um the morpheus <laughs> bitcoin meme so you're telling me you haven't seen that one? No, I haven't oh, seen this pull one. It up. Is this one? Pull it up. It's uh, Neo Morpheus. Oh, uh, the the Bitcoin meme game. I mean, the meme game in Bitcoin is very important. Uh, it is. It is. I mean, w- we weren't able to hold 11k because there just wasn't the meme game there. <laughs> 9k was the resistance. We had what was uh, 9k was the, the 9k Vegeta. was the the Vegeta. 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 I have Vegeta. No idea. I haven't watched Dragon Ball Z in too long. Oh, so God, here is. is the Morpheus meme. What are you trying to tell me? That I can trade my Bitcoin for millions someday? No, Neo. I'm trying to tell you that when you're ready, you won't have to. Oh, I do know this one. Yeah. This one. So that's all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that that seems to be a mindset. It is definitely the liquidity crunch in Bitcoin is crazy. And what's what was even more hilarious historically, and I haven't looked recently but kind of end of last year when we saw all the kind of like spam transaction stuff that people got excited about um it seemed like it there was kind of if you went and read reddit you would have assumed that during a spam attack the price would go down but that's not how it works during all of the spam attacks the price went up any guess why you're increasing demand for the network. Or well, you can't you can't put your money in a freaking exchange. You can't move your money. <laughs> Oops. The price of moving my money went up. Eh, maybe I'm not going to do it yet. Maybe, you know, maybe it's not worth it for me to go to an exchange and sell right now because the fees are going up. So, you know, I'm going to wait. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden that puts this kind of, you know, some of the psychology of the market where, the mar- where everyone, like, sees a price going flying up and they're like, oh, shit, I'm going to go sell right now because because I'm super excited, some of that psychology starts to go away because there's like this waiting period and you're like, ah, shit, there's like these fees, it sucks. So I think this will actually be kind of interesting as we get more towards stuff like Lightning. I mean, you look at, if if there's one niche where folks are, I think, could very readily adopt Lightning, it's the folks who want to be able to move their money quickly into an exchange Mm -hmm. to sell, right? So you don't necessarily want to trust an exchange to hold your money, but you do want to be able to move quickly into an exchange. Right now, there's kind of no good option. Uh, Or maybe you want to be able to arb between exchanges. There's no good option. You look at kind of how quickly can Lightning make a difference in different niches of the Bitcoin community. I think exchanges is a big one, right? Because there's only a few exchanges. They have to integrate Lightning, and all of a sudden, you can arb. You can start holding your money and be able to sell quickly. Do they have so I think to- that might actually make a difference in the way the Bitcoin markets work. Well, we have to get Coinbase to uh, to upgrade to Segwit first <laughs> before they can interact with Lightning, right? Yeah, well, I mean, who knows about Coinbase? Well, wasn't <sighs> it Brian Armstrong apparently was on CNBC saying, like, uh, Segwit's not a priority right now. Yeah, he said that. His users don't want it, apparently. But if you if you go online and read read some of the Twitter comments, it seems... Uh, Seems like he isn't listening to his users too much. I mean, he's probably right in terms of volume of users because the vast, vast majority of his users never take their money off of Coinbase. Mm -hmm. Most of his users don't give a fuck about, like, the blockchain or Bitcoin or Lightning or anything. They're just like, ah, well, I went on Coinbase. I pressed buy. I linked my bank account. They pulled money and they they gave me Bitcoin in Coinbase. Coinbase coin. And now I'm magically richer somehow. I don't even know. (laughs) And that's one thing. So that's one thing I've been spreading in this office this week is that you should get your coins off and exchange it into a personal wallet. I got everybody with hardware wallets here. Mm. Um, but like, I've been losing a little bit. I'm not gonna lie. I've lost a little bit of sleep this morning. Like thinking in retrospect, like the the responsibility of holding your own private keys and holding your own Bitcoin. That's something I'm gonna be uber cautious about moving forward. Yeah. Is making sure people really, really, truly understand what it means to to take your private keys into your own hand. Like having a safe with a million dollars under your mattress or in your back pocket all the time. I mean, it is kind of absurd when you think about it. Yeah, it's and so let's let's touch on that. For for people that are just bought Bitcoin this week and I've been blown up with DMs of people like I bought last week but I want to get it off Coinbase. Like what do I do? Yeah. I, w- I w- like I can't stress enough that you should research this as much as possible and and know what you're doing before you move your coins off exchange 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's also, you know, research, know what you're doing. I think at a high level, people kind of have an understanding that like, yeah, okay, if I pull it off an exchange, I now have this thing that represents my money. And if I lose it somehow, whether it's a hardware wallet or, or a software wallet file, whatever it is, if I lose it somehow, I'll lose my money. Knowing that versus actually appropriately understanding the risk and taking action to do something about it. So, you know, if it's a hardware wallet, it's making sure that you have a backup that you've tested that's in a safety deposit box somewhere or something like that, right? Or if it's a software wallet, again, making sure you have a backup that you've tested that is, you know, if you have your laptop in your house, you don't want to have your backup only in your house. You want to have it somewhere else too. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these steps that people hear and they kind of understand, but yeah, you whatever, it's thousand dollars of bitcoin in at this rate a week it'll be a million dollars in bitcoin <laughs> people just kind of uh people just kind of write it off and they're like you know risk is low whatever and, and i'm guilty of it too i mean we all are appropriately valuing that risk is hard um so i mean i don't know but like i don't i don't know what the solution to that is right like mm -hmm. people people um People do lose their money in this way. People are going to lose their money in this way. But but people also seem to understand it, right? When people lose their money in this way, they lose their wallet or whatever. You know, you don't have people showing up being like, ah, oh, fuck Bitcoin. Bitcoin's terrible because I lost my money. They show up and they say like, yeah, I lost my money because I didn't back it up like I was told to. I fucked up. Yeah. And like um, they, they understand it. It's just they don't, you know, plan for it in advance. Yeah. And let's roll this into a more cosmic topic, which is... Oh, dear God. <laughs> no but we're talking i mean yes yes uh we're gonna get a little bit more cosmic here but we're talking about like a a change in society like i had santiago siri on about a month ago and he compared it to when uh cities and countries first got like running water and, and baths and showers and toilets and people literally had to learn how to wipe their ass how to shower how to bathe themselves every day and we're yeah. going to go through this again with private key management and sort of security of your funds. Uh, I think it's about time. And I mean, ignore money for a second, right? We talk about countries where you can vote online using a private key that's in a smart card in your ID card, right? This is private key management, whether it's your identity and you can use it to vote or prove that you're 21 and buy or prove that you're 18 and buy cigarettes or whether it's your money and, and Bitcoin or whatever, you know, people... It's kind of about time that society starts thinking about private key management UX. I don't I don't know that you can ever build a good UX necessarily. No. But you know, having having people be more aware of what the fuck a private key is, I think has some benefit. Definitely. I mean, and it would be you'd be ignorant to not to deny those benefits this year, especially after the Equifax hack. <laughs> And like the target hack, like all the hacks that we've had, like people, yeah. people just give their data out willy nilly. I mean, we're all, we're both guilty of it. I, I'll speak for it. I'm guilty of it. Like I do that too. But like we need to move away from uh, a sort of design where we give all these companies our data to hold on servers, and yeah. more towards where we hold our data. We only reveal it when absolutely necessary. Yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously, I agree wholesale. Right? I mean, I'm. I'm certainly guilty of it, and, and I think everyone is to some extent. Um, but I, I'm hesitant about the folks who, you know, say, like, ah, oh, Bitcoin's going to save us with that. I, I don't think so, right? Okay. Like, there's, what's the, the the meme? We're going to put our medical data on a blockchain, and that's oh. going to fix it. Wait, wait a second. That doesn't make any fucking sense. Um, <laughs> I'm saying, like, but, storing your credit card information, like, on, on a Target server or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I mean... Well, so there's there's an interesting problem there, remember. So right now, if you have a credit card and it gets hacked in some way, they get the number, they steal it, whatever, you're not responsible for it. You call your bank, you tell them, like, hey, this is fraud. Maybe they give you a hard time, probably not even that, and then you don't lose any money for it. Mm -hmm. The worst that happens to you is you have to wait a week for a new credit card to come in the mail. Okay, so what? And and that's a result of the fact that this is so common, or at least easy, right? It, it's so easy to steal someone's credit card. It's so easy to, to steal the number off of it, to take a picture of it, whatever, that 
you know, banks and our, our system is built to handle that in a relatively convenient and easy way. The second we start talking about, well, your money is in a private key and how did you lose your private key? Oh, that's your fault. You're responsible for the fraud. Well, does that have societal risks? Mm. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. I don't want to say that that's, you know, all bad or good, but there's always trade-offs here, right? Yeah. There's trade-offs to... You know, a lot of people like to point to social security numbers as kind of the best example, right? Social security numbers are whatever, what, nine digits something absurdly uh, short? Four, three, and two? Yeah, nine. Nine, nine, yeah. nine digits. Um, uh, <laughs> and so they're trivial to steal. They're, they're like, there's no security there. There's no privacy there. You give it to all of your medical stuff, and you give it to all your bank stuff, and, like, whatever. They get stolen all the time. You give it to Coinbase. Yeah, and you give it to Equifax, which is apparently worse. <laughs> Who would have guessed? Um, but well, that's the thing with Equifax; people don't even get it. Give it to them. It was yeah. like a third party. They collected it from other people. Most in most cases, Equifax collected it from Coinbase, and so now you're <laughs> fucked. Yeah, but uh, but so but like the second we start talking about giving you a private key and replacing your social security number with this like private key thing, potentially, instead of there being a process to deal with a social security number that got stolen even if it's not good and it's really painful and you have to like pay lawyers and whatever that there is a process there but the second we start saying like okay no your social security number wasn't stolen that's not possible it's a private key you have it like it's given to you you still have the card like no one could have stolen that fuck you all of a sudden when that does happen because it will still happen Mm -hmm. there's if you ever find a security person who tells you that he can build something that's you know secure fire them <laughs> if they say they can build something that costs x dollars to secure they're good okay because there's always there's always a way to break it mm-hmm. maybe the threshold is a hundred thousand dollars maybe it's a million dollars maybe it's a billion dollars but there is a way to break it and the second that that threshold gets too high we start assuming that it didn't actually happen yeah if it's a hundred million if it's a million dollars to break someone's social security number and steal it and bob shows up and says like but they that's my social security number got stolen like it really did they're gonna get told to fuck off yeah. and they're gonna be on the hook for everything so there are there are still costs to that yeah and that's yeah again that's something that we touched on earlier like nobody knows exactly how this shit works and how it's gonna work mm-hmm. but what we do know is that it's revolutionary to a certain extent yeah um, I mean it is gonna carry societal changes it, it already is <laughs> like someone was saying uh I read somewhere this morning some folks were walking down the street in SF and uh, overheard some construction workers SF on the job San site. Fran for you freaks that don't know. Yeah, excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> um, and we're like listening to con- some construction workers on the job site uh, debating the the merits of different cryptocurrency portfolios, which altcoins you should be holding and, and what. That's, that's a societal change, I think, right? Like all of a sudden all these folks were like... Is it like, a societal change or is it like... Taxi drivers talking about stocks, that old adage. It's probably taxi drivers talking about stocks, but it's taxi drivers talking about but it, no, but then weird the sa- invest unregulated investment schemes. True. But at the same time it goes back to my argument earlier is like are we seeing it are we seeing technology adoption or are we seeing like uh, uh an investment bubble? I, I would, right now investment bubble. <laughs> yes. I mean I mean, yeah, it's definitely a bubble. I mean uh, come on, there's so many. The way we'll know it's not a bubble when the cryptocurrencies that have vaguely competent technology are orders of magnitude worth more than the cryptocurrencies that have incompetent nonsense technology. How many? I like to refer to, I recently started referring to, someone's going to shoot me walking down the street later for this, but I recently started referring to IOTA as the market manipulation index. Oh my God. I've gotten so many DMs about IOTA. Like, all you have to do is send people that Medium article from the MIT team that uh, audited them. I mean, like, like the, how can you trust the IOTA team the, after the those tech, vulnerabilities? The tech scene there is, like, garbage. It's nonsense, right? There, The, like, technology behind IOTA is nonsense. Don't worry. Tangle, entanglement is, is the future. It's the future. Trinary computing. <laughs> we're, we're not, we're not going to have binary computers anymore. We're preparing for the future that may or may not come. It's fine. Ugh. But but like it, the fact that IOTA gets high on the kind of 
whatever index you look at, whether it's um, you know trading volume or whether it's uh, market cap or whatever, the, when IOTA gets high on that, you know there's like absurdity in this market. Yeah, we're in a bubble. So how many blockchain projects outside of Bitcoin do you think have vaguely competent technology? <laughs> oh, God <laughs> damn it. I was hoping you wouldn't call me on that one. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting experimentation to be done i think obviously there's some some really obvious standouts that are actually really doing good work there's like monero there's there's uh, mimble wimble which i think has a test net not not a main net but um there's there's like the zcash folks have put a lot of funding into actual development of zk snarks so there's like funding going from zcash into fundamental crypto research we're gonna come back cool. to zcash we're gonna come back there's other trade-offs with zcash that i yeah. won't get into um but but um, hmm. Are there other ones? Probably. I mean, and but like also, you know, you look at ETH and a lot of people like to make ETH into a punching bag. And, you know, I think a lot of their technology decisions are, let's say, not ones I would have made, but they're experimenting. They're and experimenting, and there, yeah. there are there is some value to experimenting, even if it's not necessarily where I would be investing. There's there's value to experimenting. Yeah. So now I'm very, 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 very interested to see the transition to pos on ethereum yeah i what what's most interesting to me about pos I, pos i think is so pos stands for proof of stake it's a different way of coming to consensus on a blockchain bitcoin and ethereum at this point use proof of work which is very computer intensive the argument for proof of stake is it's less computer intensive more energy uh efficient better for the environment better for the environment and uh the knock on POS is that it's not as secure as POW. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's that's probably a fair, a fair explanation. I, I think the the interesting thing that I will watch with POS is whether or not the differences in security are accurate accurately explained. I mean, we talked about this earlier. Kind of, I like that Bitcoin has this property that if you want to use Bitcoin in this like uber secure, really wait for a week of confirmations kind of way you can and that's always an option there for you and then you can choose to have other lower security things well when you start talking about proof of stake of course there is no kind of fallback this is really secure i can look at it it's got all these really nice properties there's all kinds of weird trade-offs and like well okay in this crazy scenario or in this marginally crazy scenario you you might get screwed right so kind of accurately explaining and accurately uh, compensating for all of these various trade-offs is something that's really not easy and trying to make clear to the ethereum community and the investor community and the user community what those trade-offs are between proof of stake ethereum or proof of work bitcoin or sidechain bitcoin or lightning bitcoin or whatever it is all of a sudden starts to be a really difficult task and yeah. i'm I think that's one of the things that I'm really looking for over the next, you know, 6 to 18 to 24 months about, you know, how good is the community in actually doing that? Yeah, and that's the one thing that sort of perturbs me about <laughs> Ethereum's plan to transition to POS. There's a lot of assumptions baked into their plan. Mm -hmm. and we all know what happens when people assume. They make an ass out of you and me, and uh, I did... Again, yeah. there's just too many assumptions in my mind for me to be comfortable to think they're going to be able to do it successfully. But I, I, I would love to be proven wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, define successfully, right? Though, like, will they successfully switch to a chain that has proof of stake? Yeah, quite possibly. Will they successfully accurately describe the security trade-offs of that to their users? I mean, I don't know if they're if anyone is capable of doing that appropriately, right? Uh, I don't even know if anyone is capable of accurately understanding exactly what all of the security trade-offs are. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, Nobody knows. We're going to find knows. out. We're gonna find don't worry. Vlad's working on it. <laughs> um, Gotta love Vlad. I appreciate Vlad. I really like his Yeah, his, his comics are great. Yeah. You saw the comics that he made? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the one of... Uh, Everyone's in line everyone's for in line. Uh, for a cryptocurrency to get their transaction in the blockchain. And guy comes along. Psst, the, the, the queue short over here. <laughs> Come to my cryptocurrency. <laughs> Not that one. 
that but my favorite of him is a line of people in line just to buy cryptocurrency and the other is just one person in line looking to understand cryptocurrency <laughs> yeah that one too i um, like that one the guy looking to understand cryptocurrency no that but um, yeah so we're again like i said we're in the nascent stage of these technologies we're okay. the first guardians anybody that tells you they know what they're doing is an asshole <laughs> nobody mm-hmm. knows what they're doing at, in any in any aspect of life, nobody knows what they're doing. We're all just, yeah, we're all faking it till we make it. Exactly, right? exactly. The secret is you never make it. You just keep faking it. Yeah, you keep faking it, and hopefully you you have some happy moments along the way. Yeah, know? there we go. That's the key. Yeah, and the key is happiness, and that's the one thing. Like, I, like th- with the craze this week, with the price, God. with the price thing, like people were fomoing hard. Like, am I gonna miss the boat? Am I gonna miss the boat? Like. No. People going all in at all time highs, and I, I like in the newsletter this week. My one objective was to get everybody to take a step back, take a deep breath, and say, "All right, you you haven't missed the boat yet. Like, do not FOMO chase this. Yeah, do not spend more money than you can lose. Yeah, we, never we, spend more money than you can. We lose live on. at a time where the average American cannot afford a surprise four hundred dollar expense. Like, yeah. if you do not have enough disposable income to lose." Do not go chasing these games. Like it's absurd. Yeah, d- don't do not buy Bitcoin if you're worried. I mean, uh, you look in the space. Uh, I mean, you see people buying IOTA who can't afford to lose four hundred dollars, and you're like, whoa, all yeah. right, that's freaky. People buying Bitcoin who can't l- afford to lose the amount that they're buying. I think like that's a terrible idea. Don't do that. But God, this. I mean, the space. Like, we're, like the last however long we've been talking, everything's an experiment. All of the space we don't know. Uh, like, like we've been saying, right? No one knows Bitcoin. Yeah. No one knows what the fuck it's gonna be in ten years. No one knows if it's gonna be there in ten years. Mm-hmm. Talking about chasing gains, it's just like no. Yeah. And we're at the mecca of chasing gains, like this God. barstool sport. Like that's <laughs> that was the topic of choice this week was Bitcoin. Yeah. And it's funny though, because. We're, I mean, it was a great indicator, though, because the your average Joe still doesn't understand the tech, and that's something we need to work on. That's why I had this podcast and the newsletter, working on education, and that's yeah. why I sort of get pissed off. At, I don't get pissed off, but again, mis- going back to people being misguided is like people trying to create new protocols. Like, oh, we solved all these problems. I was like, let's focus on education first and just like figure out <laughs> – Figure out what Bitcoin is, yeah. and then let's solve the problem. Yeah, because... I don't know what the problems are yet. <sighs> There's so much goddamn marketing. It's like... <laughs> it, uh, I should avoid mentioning which cryptocurrency this was, but, but back in the day, back, I don't know, three or four years ago... Um, Every meetup, every Bitcoin meetup, you know, the Bitcoin meetups everywhere was kind of the only real quote unquote cryptocurrency at the time. You go to any Bitcoin meetup and there was like three or four people who were there purely to shill this cryptocurrency and they were paid for it. And literally it was hilarious because they, 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 for, I don't know, three months, four months, they were all showing up. They were all there every time and they were shilling this cryptocurrency hard. They were like, oh, this is going to replace Bitcoin. It's going to be great. And then there was this point where all of a sudden, none of them were shilling that cryptocurrency anymore. And you asked a few, you know, meetups, you go to drinks afterwards, you ask them, they're like, well, you see, I was getting paid, but then I was informed I was a volunteer, and so now I don't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you know what? Does it rhyme it's with one cash? Of the, it's one of the biggest cryptocurrencies right now. Does it rhyme with cash? No, no. Well, I'm sure that's happening now, but but back three or four years ago now. But but in terms of marketing, like some of these cryptocurrencies, just they spend all their money on marketing and they do very very well. It's <sighs> like yeah, but you don't spend any money on technology. You're building something that's actually useful. You just spent all your money on marketing. Well, so. mm, we're we're getting a we're getting a you're shitting we're on other projects now. No, we're not going to shit on other projects. I mean, fuck it, we'll shit on other projects. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're getting a. We're getting a, a a a master's degree caliber uh, education on these marketing plans via ICOs this year. Like, I mean, oh you want to talk about perverse incentives? Like, asking for hundreds of millions of dollars up front with vaporware and it's, pure marketing. Like, it it it's even it <laughs> the, the ICOs that I love are the ones that are pitching to VCs and doing 
just killer jobs, right? Like, if you're a VC right now, uh, I shouldn't name names. If you're a VC right now, right, you're sitting here, someone comes to you and says, like, hey, I've got this ICO. You can buy now, and then in two weeks, it's going to go public, and it's going to hit these unregulated crypto markets, and you can dump your share for, eh, even if it's only a 20% gain. Well, well, no, I mean, normally VCs... it's a 2x gain, but even if it's only a 20% gain, you're talking about VCs who are used to sitting on investments for five years, 10 years before they see any profit. They're talking about like a week, 20% gains. That's absurd. And it's not even like they're like, oh, we're going to take this gain. They have the fiduciary responsibility to take those gains once oh, they yeah. arrive. So they're oh, yeah. like, they're, they, ha- they have... They have to take those gains immediately, and and the whole incentive system in these ICOs is so fucking perverse that like you give these VCs early round discounted token sales, and then they're able to dump right away as soon as the token's launched. It's like, what like what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to like it's absurd. create a revolution, or are we just trying to make rich people richer? Like, yeah, are we trying to scam off random people buying random ICOs that? Exactly, and then probably you get in, never build any tech. And then going back to the whole ethos of this, like, are you like, you're gonna offer VCs like the bulk of your token supply up front, and this these are supposed to be decentralized, sort of saturated tokens, and you're, you're, go- <sighs> yeah, we've know. had <laughs> we've had a number of conversations in the office about it, and it's funny. I mean, like, uh, you know, we we can challenge on it, and we're kind of like, yeah, you know, look. Free market's free market, caveat emptor, whatever, it's great, you can do what you want, but what, (laughs) honestly, what bugs me more than anything is I, you know, or, or, you know, we, kind of the Bitcoin community, I, someone who is focusing on building technology, who is focusing on improving Bitcoin and and hopefully winning a culture war to, to, to set up a Bitcoin for 10 years from now, you know, I, I'm getting lumped into this boat with people who are just creating coins, mm-hmm. giving them to VCs. VCs are making a 30% profit, passing them off to the public in what is probably illegal in the U.S., mm-hmm. and then never even building the technology behind it. Just blatant scams. Like, I'm sitting here in the same bucket as these guys. I'm just kind of like, I uh, you're not in the don't want to. I mean... Uh, Cryptocurrency in general. Sure. I mean, but cryptocurrency to yeah. the population to whatever ends up in the same bucket. And it, it's it's disheartening, it right? Is, it it is, is disheartening that's like that's the thing that people see when they talk about Bitcoin. Or that is what some people see when they talk about cryptocurrency as a whole. Well, and this goes back to the whole aspect we were talking about earlier. Of, uh, I was saying these things are going to change us more than we change them. Like this I- whole ICO madness is just a reversion to the systems we're trying to get away from. You know, conspicuous consumption, uh, basically creating tokens out of thin air, creating money out of thin air. That's what, what it reminds me of. Um, yeah. And then going beyond that, like you said, like it's all vaporware. Like the, the, So the, much of it. So much of it is. <sighs> Some of it, so much of it is like, so, I'm going to solve a 30-year-old unsolved problem in computer science as long as you give me $100 million to do it. No, it, you're not. No, you're not. You're going to go chill on a beach. and Yeah. That's like, so I wrote about this in my newsletter earlier this summer. It's something that pissed me off beyond belief. There was a meetup, an Ethereum ERC-20 meetup in Austin, Texas, I believe, earlier this summer. Uh, I think Whale Panda like tweeted about it, and I went into the meet- meetup group. And the description of the meetup group was, come, we'll teach you how to spin up an ERC-20 token, uh, launch an ICO, make sure you have a good marketing plan. <laughs> like, it wasn't have a good tech idea, like have a good <laughs> problem to solve. It was like, make sure you have a good marketing plan. Like, they weren't even, like, pretending yeah. that they're – that they're going to create like a, a life changing technology. Yeah. When a friend of mine pointed out, was like, uh, you know, works in a co working space that was holding, you know, a, a whatever, ERC 20 type meetup. Um, <laughs> and in resp- kind of the friend was sitting there listening to the, to the meetup and was listening to a presentation. And, and the response to every paragraph, every line that person said was why. And I think that that maybe is symbolic of that of a big part of that community is like you're not allowed to ask why. Yeah. 
you're not allowed to ask why in the hell does this matter? Why is this an important thing to build? What is this going to do for anyone? You just build it. You're not allowed, you're not allowed to ask why. Why do we have crypto kitties? <laughs> so because I'm gonna shit Tamagotchi. on crypto. I'm gonna shit on crypto kitties right now. I saw a tweet yesterday that pissed me off and sent me down a dark path that Uh-oh. I have to talk about. Uh-oh. It was some San Fran fucking tech bro with kids. He was like, "Oh my god, my daughter just asked me for a crypto kitty. I have to buy one for her." And I just had like this <laughs> this daydream where you go down like you just envision the future where you you revert to the super sweet sixteen mentality where you have kids fighting over crypto kitties that their parents fight for and it's just so materialistic and vapid that it <laughs> pisses me off like it, it you can buy your tamagotchi me. on a blockchain now it infuriates me like just don't it, forget to feed it do you have to feed <laughs> crypto kitties i don't actually know i don't know if you have to feed them but you have to make uh-huh. them fuck apparently that's uh that's <laughs> that's what everybody's talking about is breeding crypto kitties how to make sure your cats have good sex <sighs> it's very important but again like we're trying to get away from this this culture of conspicuous consumption and fucking fiat money. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if Bitcoin's going to fundamentally change culture in that way. I think okay. that's something that's going to have to happen on its own. But you can you do know, a crypto kitty. About... You don't need a blockchain to do a crypto yeah, yeah, kitty. You don't need a blockchain. Someone, someone on Twitter was saying, and, and I have not verified this. I, I probably shouldn't repeat it, but but someone was claiming that the crypto kitty contract, the way it was set up. It was actually someone who, who, the person who instantiated the contract is able to change it arbitrarily. Oh, yeah. Oh, they are. I read that. So, so read... it's not no, yeah. It's not even a decentralized CryptoKitty. No. It's a CryptoKitty that is centralized but happens to be on a blockchain. It's, it's, a centralized, it's a centralized DAP. It's a centralized, decentralized application. Yeah. Um, that, that sounds useful. And it completely crippled the Ethereum <laughs> network, which is supposed to <laughs> run the world computer that will run apps for oh, everything. God. For everything. Yeah. You want your medical data? You Even want your, your centralized apps. Yeah. It, you, you run your centralized apps on Ethereum and you blow up Ethereum. Oh, so <laughs> wait. That's not how it's supposed to happen. No. Well, well, sharding and pruning are coming. Don't worry. Sharding is a joke. Why is it a joke? <laughs> Tell me. Uh, I, I think sharding ultimately... So... Uh, sharding is... What's the, the yeah, okay. argument that sharding... Makes. So, so sharding essentially the, the basic concept, right, is, is we have this blockchain. It doesn't scale, and so let's separate it into a bunch of different blockchains and and move things between it, right? So, basic computer science principle: if I want to run CryptoKitties, maybe we have CryptoKitties mostly on one shard, and then that doesn't affect other shards. And that, that's fine in principle, but w- what really irks me about sharding is that. Everyone talking about sharding, they're actually talking about one of two things. It's either extension blocks or sidechains. Mm-hmm. It, it's not new. It's not a new idea. It's just an old idea rebranded and an old idea rebranded, but two different old ideas rebranded under the same name with nothing new. So, like, someone says sharding, and you don't know if they're talking about extension blocks or sidechains. Normally, they're talking about some, like, magical, mystical being that is both a sidechain and the scalability properties but it's extension block and the security properties but in reality they don't actually have an idea of how to do that because it doesn't seem possible to do that and so but so like it it it's just like to me it's a joke because if you're talking about sharding that probably means you either a don't have a concrete idea of what your security model is and thus you hand wave hand wave end up with a sidechain security model but don't mean to or b you don't have an idea of what scaling is in which case you hand wave hand wave and end up with extension block scaling without really realizing it without meaning to and what irks me the most about the sharding argument is that these guys are so so confident that they're going to be able to do it successfully um, but, like, what does successfully mean? Well, I can build a successful sidechain right now. I can build a successful extension block right now. But what I'm talking about, it reminds me of working at the Futures Fund and meeting. So my job was to meet with hedge fund managers that and to understand their trading uh, algorithms and their sort mm-hmm. of their, their strategies behind trading. Mm-hmm. And for a lot of the upstart hedge funds that would come and pitch us, they would, they would base – 
their future performance on back tested theoretical returns. Yeah. So they basically run their strategy using data that's already happened. So they would sure. they would go back like ten years and say, All right, if we applied our strategy to the markets ten years ago and like ran it, yeah. here's the returns that would be. And what you f- what you would find is as soon as those strategies would go live, their actual returns would be nowhere near what their what their back tested returns were like. Yeah. And that's what I feel is that that's sort of the analogy that I have like a visceral feeling with sharding and this this transition yeah. to POS for Ethereum. They're like, look, we're running it on test net. We're, we're doing the test for simulating it. It's, it's, it. We're simulating it. It's going to work. But just from experience in different aspects of life, like the simulation never, never is as perfect as reality or reality is never as perfect as a simulation Excuse yeah me. no i think that's that's probably pretty accurate for for sharding and 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 proof of stake too i mean proof of stake is it is my impression that proof of stake is something which is more kind of quote-unquote fragile it's more difficult to get right there's more edge cases that you have to make sure you handle proof of stake the edge cases you have to make sure your handle is like okay well that's actually probably not really gonna happen in real life whereas in proof of stay or sorry proof of work it's the edge cases you're gonna handle probably not really gonna happen in real life but proof of stake you have edge cases where you're kind of like well maybe this won't happen but unlike proof of work we're like ah well you're gonna see one confirmation that's gonna go away well hopefully you were waiting for six not a huge deal one confirmation reorgs happen all the time with proof of stake, you look at it and you're like, well, here's this case where you think it is buried with a day of confirmations and then it just kind of disappears or you the network forks and you just have to stop and you have to go ask Reddit what the current blockchain is. You know, making sure you handle these things well, I think becomes much more critical in proof of stake. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think there's people working on it. I don't think it's impossible to handle these cases well, but... It is more important that you do it, and what you know what worries me is that people aren't going to handle all these cases, and they're not going to be paying that much attention, and they're just going to kind of deploy it, and they're going to run simulations, and the simulations are going to look fine, but in the real world where you have people potentially attacking it for million-dollar profits, it might be not so accurate. I think the Dow hacker might be waiting in the brush with some zero days somewhere. Oof. Um. That's another that's another bearish case for Ethereum right there, because um, that dude, Ooh. he, f- he did pretty fuck, well. He fucked them up. Yeah, yeah, he, really did. He made short code isn't law. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think I think the DAO hack was really interesting when looking at Ethereum. Like I was talking, we were talking a bit earlier about kind of what the process for consensus changes might be and and what you know this culture war of Bitcoin. Well, I think another way to say culture war is is what's the precedent. What is the uh-huh. precedent for how changes are made? And anytime you make a change, that to some extent sets a precedent for the future about what kinds of changes are acceptable to the community and what the community, you know, is or isn't going to fight back against, whatever. whatever. Um, but, but when you talk about the DAO, well, well there's a precedent there. Uh-huh. There's a precedent that if you steal enough money and, and the people kind of quote unquote in charge lose enough money, then fuck you, that just gets reverted. As long as it's reasonably technically possible to revert it. What are you talking about? The Ethereum community came to consensus after the DAO fork. Yeah, in like two days. And there was a what was it vote. Like, and what was it like wasn't half consensus. a percentage? Half a percentage of people voted? Oh, yeah. Half something. a percentage of Ethereum voted? Something like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't blame them. They were on a timeline. And, and further, I, I really wouldn't blame them. Like, that's... That's the kind of system they want to run, and that's fine. And I think there's a lot of value in that system existing. It's not a system I'm interested in. It's not a system I want to contribute to. It's certainly not a system I would put money in because I'm trusting that development community. Whether you think they're great developers or not doesn't really matter. I don't want to trust them. I got into Bitcoin because I don't want to trust anyone. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have no interest in that. But other people do, and that's great. No, that's Now, I think we can build systems on top of bitcoin that have a similar trust model and also happen to use bitcoin the asset which is appreciated how much this year and we're going to cut it there for this episode matt and i had a three-hour conversation i don't want to bore you with it all at once 
So come back uh, in a couple days. I think I'm going to post this on Thursday. Uh, and you'll hear me and Matt talk about Lightning Network, side chains, vegan versus carnivory diet, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, again, thanks for listening, freaks, and I'll see you soon. Peace and love.